myself, like, uh, I do this work, but I also have I have the experience of it. Like, I was a young mom. Um, so I was a teen and I became a mom. And so I experienced housing discrimination and landlords trying to ask me for, you know, six months of rent in advance because they couldn't trust that I could afford it. And it's like, who's in a position as like a young single mom to give six months of rent? Um, and to be denied apartments and not even, not even like having the knowledge to know that what I was experiencing was discrimination. So um, I think working here also has been eye-opening for myself to realize uh, that people don't know all the time that they're being discriminated against and, and how to claim your rights because you get discriminated against. And then usually your, your main focus is to, you know, you're looking for housing, so you want to move on and find the next and find a place to live. And so a lot of people don't know that, you know, they don't have to, um, they don't have to act right away. Like they can wait till they're in a better spot in their lives or in a better headspace and then, um, you know, document everything and make sure they can go back later to like the human rights tribunal um, and file even like a year later. So a lot of people don't know that and they also just don't, don't have the framework to know uh, what they're experiencing is actually against the law. Um, so I think our, a big part of our job is education and just letting people know what their rights are so that they feel empowered to enforce them um, and let them know what their legal avenues um, are. So I think, yeah, that's a big part of our work. Well, thank you very much. experiences, the issues that I could take a plan of action to fight on behalf of the community and make it into um, uh, an issues and, and, and to fight. So here we also are willing to answer the experts here your questions. So if you have questions you can line up there and uh, hopefully we'll be glad to, to answer them or you can share your story so that it helps me you know formulate a better way of, of understanding your concerns uh, on, on, on housing issues so that I then uh, take that to fight on, on behalf of our community on that issue. So you can line up here, this, this microphone up here. Does anyone have questions for us? Or what, um, what Emily was saying, they'll give them 
They'll allow them to build higher than the zoning in exchange for, com for community benefits. Very seldom, so very few cases, these community benefits include cheaper rental. Most, most of the time, these community benefits include things like parks. Uh, you know, in, in, in Weston, there's the case of the farmer's market. They, they're going to create a space for the farmer's market. But the units themselves, it's very hard to force a developer to rent for cheaper. That being said, we are um, asking City Hall to, when they consider the applications put in by the developers, we'd like to see them partner with nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. and we will consider those applications in preference to developers who have not partnered with um, a nonprofit organization or like a co op type situation. But I mean, at, at the end of the day, it is, um, I guess, whatever offers the best money the city thinks that they can get out of it seems to all be profit driven. And then when it comes down to, um, we call those like town hall meetings with the density, we were discussing, we would like to see taller buildings so that we can get more affordable <laughs> units, but many people are against the, the breaking of the zoning bylaws. You know, people who have smaller houses, you know, the not in my backyard mentality, right? So I mean, this is a, it's a war in between our own factions and uh, I think people are considering the fact that we are hurting ourselves so again, development doesn't need to mean displacement. We can include everybody, but we need to start thinking of some part. Thank and you. that's what you're doing? That is definitely what we are trying to do. Okay. I would uh, encourage everybody maybe to join me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, one, I just want to put, uh, put out there that one of the things that uh, you, you mentioned, Ebony, was about organizing and, uh, you know, the NDP federally has put out a platform, a commitment to um, building 500,000 new affor affordable housing units across the country um, as, as, par as part of the platform of what yeah, the yeah, government yeah. Question would be. So yeah. that's the kind of thing that I think we can organize for and I'd like to throw to everybody. As well, you have a but, question. Um, Excuse me. You have uh, a question. Ebony, yeah, Ebony, you mentioned uh, specific about organizing. Yes. And John, I know you probably talked about this, but I, I want to hear from everybody here on this. What are some What are some tangible things that um, people in the room here can do as part of that org as part of that organizing? Um, and because uh, I know for myself, you know, Johnny uh, was really helpful <coughs> in helping. I'm a tenant, and uh, he was able to help us start a tenant association in our in, in, in my building, which is just across the park here. Uh, so I think just to know how can people get involved in that because it sounded very daunting until we did it. So I think just to know. It does, it is a large task for one person to do obviously, but um, tenant associations are a great way to get things done. And Johnny just did this to our building too. You and Medina pulled these two buildings together. And um, I'm beginning to see the lack of apathy disappear. I mean, the apathy disappear. People feel like one person can't do anything, which is true. It's easy for your landlord to bully you, push you around, ignore you, but it's kind of hard to ignore like a third of your building. So um, something you could do, um, whether you are an ACORN member or just by yourself, is talk to your neighbors. I mean, I don't think that anybody has that sense of community when you live in a high-rise building. How many people know the names of everybody on their floor? I, I'm trying to make it a point to know all my neighbors. I want to know who's got the children. God forbid there was a fire. I'm knocking on doors. I want to know who's got kids. I want to know who's home during the day. I need to know my neighbors. And in knowing my neighbors, I can understand better the problems that they face. Like, um, I have bad cabinets. It wasn't until I got to know the gentleman who lives directly underneath me, he also has black mold in his cabinets. So now I know to look for that because these, these things spread. Right? So now I know the people underneath me and above me, we all have the same crack in our walls. That being said, we can all put in work orders now. And now it's a more pressing situation for the landlord. So just organizing amongst yourselves is one thing. If you um, find that you've got a bunch of people who are facing cockroach issues, 
right? You can also band together to call 311. If enough of you call 311, they will send out a city inspector, someone who's like a third party. It's not the landlord coming to look at it now. It's like the big guys. But that's more than just me calling. I mean, I'll need like at least 20 phone calls. So you can organize amongst yourselves like that. You can come out to ACORN and you can help organize by knocking on doors, posting flyers. I mean, we've got spaces available at the headquarters to make phone calls, place phone calls, um, printing flyers. There's so much work to be done. So whether it's just something simple in your building or that you feel like you've got a little bit of extra time and you want to help the bigger cause, I mean, there's a bunch of things you can do. Write letters to your MVP, write letters to your city council, or send emails to John Tory. If you have a free day, you can go down to City Hall. I mean, there's much. And your question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. First, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. It's an honor. Honor is mine. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, I want to ask you first question. If I do not live in the city of York, but it still is in my heart because I lived it very long time. All my kids are born here. But right now I live a little bit out of the door. How can I support? to work harder of what you're trying to reach. That's my first question. Do you want to answer first, or I can go the same? Um, well, I'm not quite sure. I mean, for me being a member, I need to live in my organization. But I think you could write a member to, or write to your MVP no matter where you live. That, that was exactly my <laughs> second question. Do I need to be a member to help you? No, you don't. So with ACORN, ACORN often organizes events. For example, on April 5, which is Friday, uh, we're going to walk from Ebony's oh, Building. Sorry, that again? April 5 at 6 p.m., 6.15 p.m. in front of 2450 Weston Road. That's the intersection of Weston and Old. Okay. We're going to start the march there, and we're going to walk down. When people in the community or people who feel like they're part of the community, even though they don't live here, come and join those marches. It gives us numbers. It gives us also, more importantly, psychological support. We, we want to think that people support our cause. We don't want to think that we're alone in this. Gotcha. This is big support. If you have the time and the know-how, even if it's not your building, you can go to other people's buildings uh, to help them organize a, a, a tenant association. For example, Ebony mentioned that, oh, you know, you, you want to know your neighbor, you want to get together. Concretely speaking, the way that happens is you print out flyers or maybe you handwrite them if it's a small enough building and you post and, and, and you distribute those flyers to your neighbors saying, we're meeting Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. in the lobby of the building and we're gonna form it. It's as easy as that. You meet and then you start talking, right? And so if, if you're someone who doesn't live in that building, you can support maybe by providing free printouts of the pamphlets, things like that. Okay. Um... If I have a disability issue and I cannot walk, do the walk to walk. Is that the last one, last point you brought up that I can do for help? Both various, um, whatever needs for doing that. Well, I mean, as far as physical march goes, if you've got a disability and you don't have a scooter, then you could always meet us at the end of the march and wave a flag, or you could always. Um, make yourself available to give some sort of like a speech. I mean, sometimes we have press that comes out, but sometimes they want to hear people's stories. You could always offer your services that way. Um, what else? I mean, we well, always we're, take we're, the march <laughs> end, exactly. Sorry? It ends at 2240 Western Road. So that's by Church Street, and it'll be out in front of Astoria oh, Place. Oh, yes, I know. It's also yeah. owned by Q Residential. So. Okay. In that right. aspect, we're trying to get everyone, not even my building, but everyone who's got the same landlord together. So I'm getting to know not just my neighbors, but like my, my sister neighbors down the street. Thank you. I got a question for uh, this two ladies. Celia. 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 Anyways, uh, first I thank you as I did uh, the previous speaker for your service. And we really do appreciate uh, My question to you, both of you, is uh, I'm a community head the neighborhood where I live right now. And I used to be here too. Um, I have quite a few tenants with a disability who lives different property managed by different companies, including ECMC, Dell, um, 
how, how they do not have accessibility. Okay, disability accessibility. And they have a really difficult, someone has to come out to let them in. Either grab their arms or their wheelchair to let them in. What can you do for those people? And by a couple of Sure, um, so I can sort of um, so, yeah, that's a, a big bulk of our work is um, assisting, um, assisting clients who call us who have disabilities, um, who need accommodations in housing or to make their building or their unit more accessible um, <coughs> to meet their needs. So, like, the Human Rights Code, it really looks at uh, integration and full participation. So, we take that as, you know, people with disabilities, they want to live in they don't want to be relying on neighbors and things like that. So we would look at um, what do they need in their building or their unit, and it's coming from them. They tell us. We don't make it up. You know, they know. They're experts of their own lived experience, so they know what they need. And so we just help them with the advocacy part of it. You tell us what you would need to live um, independently and have, uh, you know, have your building or unit be accessible, and. Uh, We'll either give you tools and strategies to self-advocate, um, like what you should be saying to your landlord and like how to cite certain uh, parts of the law, or, uh, or we can reach out for you. We can write a letter to your housing provider. We can follow up with them directly, have a conversation. This is what the tenant needs to live, um, to live independently, either in their unit and or building. Um, and you have a legal duty to accommodate is there, is there any viable uh, for accessibility? Yeah, so there's a few. Um, so under, you know, there's the AODA. Uh, Sorry? There's the AODA. Okay. Uh, Ability for Ontarians with Disabilities. Okay. Right? Yeah, so that's set by the, by the province. Um, so that, uh, that applies to housing providers. So they have a legal, like, they have to meet certain um, accessibility, uh, accessibility thresholds. But also under the Human Rights Code, it's called the duty to accommodate. So it's a particular part of the Human Rights Code that um, that makes sure that you know going beyond just general accessibility requirements, it's looking that each individual has their own needs, um, and so it really looks at an individual approach. Like, what does this person need um, to live independently? So if you're talking about generally. It would be like the AOTA, but if you're talking about individual needs, you'd be looking at the duty to accommodate under the code. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. We have a person who has been very patient. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Try to be patient. Yes. I've been waiting years actually to ask this question. Uh, um, I'll ask a question before I explain why. I live at a Canadian Mental Health Association house. It's owned by the Canadian Mental Health Association. Uh, I suffer from post traumatic stress disorder. I want to know, in this case would be, if the Canadian Mental Health Association is breaking mental health laws, who do I go to? Because the police can't get involved with that. That's Canadian Mental Health Association. If they are also breaking rentals rules and laws, who do I go to? And if this is going on every day, 24 hours a day, over and over again, every day, now this went on for a year before the household threatened to kill the person who was causing this problem, before the person stopped. But at no time whatsoever did the Canadian Mental Health Association, which is my landlord, actually get involved to stop this. Now this person was basically standing outside my bedroom door. Now this happened 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a year. I lost three jobs because of it, four jobs because of it. He was standing outside of my bedroom door, kicking, punching, screaming, some of the most heinous words you can imagine. I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I call the police, the police show up, the landlord comes out and says, oh, that's okay, we're the Canadian Mental Health Association, we're taking care of it. The police leave, and I gotta do it again, and I gotta lose another job. And I, and I was actually on my way to being able 
to get off of disability and support myself from a job because I can't get a place to rent because I don't have the credit. Otherwise, I have two supports, which gives me $1,000 credit, plus I was working, which gave me, I had no problem with renting a place, finding a place to rent, but what landlord has to rent to me if I have zero credit? So I'm trying to understand how do I get protection from my own landlord when my landlords, the the law, the the, the law enforcement, they're the they're the mental health law. It's kind of like if the police assault you, who do you call? Yeah. Um, and also, just to make sure this is understood, I've already written to the courts. I've already written to everybody that I possibly could write to. I've already went to look to legal aid. I've already went to the. I've written to everybody. Everybody, I'm waiting for the courts to get back. I mean, the courts apparently told me it would take six to eight weeks from the time that I hand in the application to the time of the court date. It's been six weeks. I'm still waiting for them to get back to me to tell me that I'm going to have a court date. So this kind of gives me an understanding. I'm going to have to start that process all over again. But how does legal aid have the right to refuse me? How does my landlord have the right to break all these laws against me, terrorize me for a year Thank long? You. Thank you. I think we get the okay. yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the answer. So yeah, it can be really challenging. I like that's yeah, a really challenging situation. And landlords do have to deal with harassment between tenants. They do have to intervene in those cases. It is probably a little bit different if it's a, if it's a CMHA house. Um, I don't know exactly what law they fall under, so that would be, I'd have to re do some research there. Um, but typically, yeah, if it's harassment, your landlord should be intervening in that harassment, right? My landlord was also the caretaker for this person. This person wasn't mentally, this person was mentally ill. Yeah, yeah. The landlord was the caretaker. That's why mm -hmm. I presume it's their fault, but he's breaking the law wherever his caretaker is, is responsible to a lot of things. But I don't know who to ask. I don't know who to go to. I'm still in this situation trying to get back the, the monies that I lost last year, and I don't know what to do. I'll give you my cop, so just to uh, just uh, you can touch my office. Hey, I live on the corner of your office. I actually want to walk in there for a few times, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. let me come to this meeting first, awesome. and I will come into your office. Thank you, love. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So okay, is this like an unanswered question? Because I assume this is a hard question. It's a very specific situation that yes. got a lot of complex overlays, yes. right? So um, I'm not sure it's something that we can fully address at this moment, as we have other people that we'd like to get to. But like Faisal said, um, we could talk to you afterwards. Yes, I just but it is a very unique case, right? And there's a lot of complex factors here. I'm really sorry that this is happening to you, and thank you for bringing it to my attention. I mean, like. I've had some horrors myself, but nothing quite so horrible as that. I mean, being uncomfortable in your own house. This is something that I'm only getting a small part of what really happened and what's going on in my life. But I'm gonna, I was actually just hoping you guys would hear my question and maybe yeah. I could come and discuss it with you another we'll day and you guys can think account. about it. I just need to know who am I supposed to be even asking these questions to? Well, you started the, down the right path. We will discuss okay. it with you afterwards, but thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. What was your name again? I will be the first part. Yeah. Your name? Your name, you said? Your name. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Uh, Francesco Palomo. Francesco. Francesco. Okay. Thank you so much, Francesco. No problem. I want to say just one thing, and Ebony and Johnny can talk about this more as well, but when we organize tenants' associations in buildings, it really does result in putting money into people's pockets, and we have two success stories on Western Road from just a couple of months ago as well when a group of tenants formed a tenants association, stood up to their landlord against an unfair rent increase, an above guideline increase, and they were able to get that increase reduced in addition to claiming their automatic rent reduction. So that put about 80 to $100 back in people's pockets because they stood up and they demanded their rights. And that happens when we get together. So I want to I make sure everybody knows that there are good news stories in this in this issue as well. And it starts by talking to your neighbors. It starts by, you know, joining together and joining forces because we can have those kinds of victories. So I wanted to just make sure that that message gets out across to everyone here. And if you need help forming a tenants association, speak to myself, Ebony, Johnny, we can all help you with resources, with flyers, with people power 
to make sure that you're feeling strong and empowered to do those things. My question is, um, well, for all of the panelists, I'm especially interested in hearing from Sarah, just because I know your work in preventing eviction. What we've seen with our current premier, I'll step back so I don't blow on the mic, with our, our premier has rolled back tenant rights in a lot of ways. And not only has, has Doug Ford completely eliminated rent control on new development, and this is especially important in Weston, in York Southwestern, because we have the Mount Dennis LRT, we have lots of new development coming in, we have a new 30-story building that was built in, in rental, but because of the new law that our Premier has passed, none of those units are going to be rent controlled. It means every year the landlord can increase the rent, whichever amount he or she wants or feels is necessary to keep their units um, uh, competitive in the market, to make sure that they can maximize their profits. And there is no law now that prevents them from doing that. So in addition to completely eliminating rent control on new units, our premier has also and is also planning on speeding up the eviction process. And so we know, and I know, working with so many tenants and working with different tenants associations, that when you get your full first notice of eviction, maybe you're just a couple dollars short, you know? Maybe something happened and you're just a couple dollars short, and all you need is a few extra days to be able to make that final payment and, and pay your full rent. So our premium right now is, increase, is allowing landlords to increase rents exponentially and is then making it easier for landlords to evict people for various kinds of reasons and speeding up that, that eviction process. So my question, as an organization that is working to prevent eviction, working to ensure the right to housing for people in the city and across the province, what kind of threat do you see that posing for the work that you're doing, but also for the folks who are struggling to get by and pay rent as of yet? And to turn to our, our MPP, of course, as a member of the official opposition, uh, what kind of work is the NDP doing to, to try and hold those kinds of changes uh, at bay? So I appreciate the time. Thank you, Kira. Well, we are very concerned about um, speeding, up, speeding up the eviction process, I think. Um, you know, it works in the favor of landlords and not in the favor of tenants. Um, I, a lot of people don't know what the eviction process is like. A lot of people like just don't have that education and knowledge. And so that works against them. And um, so that's one of the things we do is that we really hope to spread that knowledge to people about the eviction process. A lot of people will get their first notice and they'll leave on the date on that notice, right? Without even realizing that they have the chance to go to the landlord and tenant board and argue this case. Um, so I think to fight that, I think education is going to really impact that. But obviously, we would love it if the process isn't sped up. <laughs> yeah, I think also the the problem too is I think like at least from what we've read, it's like a lot of deregulation and you know not necessarily having a lender and tenant board, but maybe having um, people who aren't you know adjudicators and things like that being able to to speed up this process. And I, I think that it's really dangerous, and especially like, it, especially for tenants having a disadvantage just not being able to get like legal representation and like, legal services. Um, I find that very scary because, you know, especially when you are able to access a legal clinic, you need a lot of time to like let them know that you have this eviction case and, you know, to actually get them to be able to represent. And, and a lot of people just aren't getting that <coughs> So I think speeding this up is going to give people less of a chance to get either you know legal information from us or legal services, legal representation, and I think like that is also scary as well. Erin, could I just follow up that question with, since you say education is so important, could you quickly help educate us about the difference between an eviction notice and an eviction order, mm -hmm. and how people should react to to either of those things, and just so that you know we can walk away with a little bit more knowledge in our pocket. Yeah, so Thank you. I think there's also a huge lineup. Let's keep it to one question. Yeah, so the first thing you'll get is a notice. The notice is, um, will tell you what you're being evicted for. 
Um, so it could be rent deliveries, it could be a lot of different things. If the issue is not solved, then they apply to the landlord and tenant board and you get a notice of hearing, that will be an L form. And so that will give you a hearing date at the landlord and tenant board. Then when you go to the landlord and tenant board, that right now we're looking at a couple months wait, um, then the adjudicator decides whether or not you're being evicted. And obviously it's a little bit different for every case. Um, if, the, if the adjudicator decides that you're being evicted, you get an order. That means you have 11 days. Then they call the sheriff's office. And when the sheriff or the court <coughs> officer comes, that's the day they actually have to leave. So a lot of people will leave earlier, um, but it's important for people to know that they don't have to leave until it's actually time to leave. Um, it gives you time to find other housing if you are being evicted. So I have a question for you. Do we still have that order of stay? I mean, I had one of those happen once. Was it extended that 11 days to 21 days, or was that also just thrown out? I believe we still have it, so but I'm not 100%. Sure. In very special circumstances, you yeah. may be able to get an order of stay, which um, even though they've already applied to the sheriff, you can now get another hearing and you get 21 days now. But um, generally, once you get the notice on your door that is stamped with that little red circle that says the sheriff has received the information and is coming out, it could be any time. And um, usually between one and two weeks if you're lucky. And once he's locked your door, you have 72 hours to get your belongings. You have to make an arrangement with the landlord, but that is that. They will change the locks and you are now homeless. Thank you. And uh, Kiara asked also, what am I doing as your representative? And I have been a member of the official opposition. We are standing up for conservatives and fighting. These laws are not fair to tenants. And they are wrong and definitely we need rent control and more affordable housing. tonight, but I want a solution, and the solution is going to require money. This, this past year, I've had a couple of opportunities to become a landlord, and when I looked at the cost to rent the property, and the rental it would be, it would not have been affordable. I would have been at great risk, and I was totally discouraged from becoming a landlord. We sold the property. I have not heard in this discussion, and this bothers me, I have not seen good numbers on what a rental property, multi-story, costs per square foot, either to purchase or to operate. I haven't heard what's a reasonable rent or return on investment. I haven't heard what's a reasonable cost for maintenance. And I haven't heard reasonable cost for damages by tenants. And without those numbers, we don't know if the landlords are lying through their teeth and they're making a fortune, which somehow I don't think is true because I've heard of buildings being abandoned. Apartment buildings where the owner just walked away from it because they didn't want to deal with it anymore and they asked for a demolition order. I've also heard people say they've got rats and roaches and the landlord is still cashing the rent checks. Yeah. So do we have good numbers so we can go there and say this building should be at this rental, it would give you a fair return, if you had a clue how to manage it, you would be making a profit here. But you're incompetent and you're not doing your job, and that's why you're losing money. Instead of which, we're rewarding the incompetent people. And the people who are competent, they're not going to come back and say, yeah, we could charge a lot less, but we're competent and people like it, so we're just going to charge them 20% more than we need. So why don't we have those numbers to go out and say, this is a bad building, so we should take it over and do it properly, and let's get it flipped. Why aren't we moving in that direction where we'll increase supply, instead of which we're just sitting there, spinning our wheels, it's been going on like this as long as I can remember, which is about, <coughs> in the rental market about 50 years now. There's good landlords and bad, and if you're a tenant, you just hope you get a good landlord and you can afford to pay the rent. But we haven't solved the problem of putting supply out there so there's rental apartments that are available. So what, can we get those numbers, and can we go out there and attack the bad landlords and get them brought up to a better place in the, in the business? Yeah, yes, Mike, I have some numbers for you. Uh, Q Residential, uh, the landlord that owns the building where Ebony lives, and Hisham, and maybe a few others, uh, they are owned by uh, a sort of a private investment 
for a man named John Lego, but they are also co-owned by Manulife Financial. Uh, they paid $36 million for the property at 2450-2460 when they bought it a few years ago. Today they collect $6.5 million a year. You do the math. In only six years, they can pay, they can collect the value of the, the property. Notwithstanding, they have operational costs and everything, but this is an amazing investment opportunity. There is a, it, it's, when it comes to, the, so there's two different questions. When it comes to small landlords, there's always questions. When it comes to these investors that buy properties uh, just to milk them to death, there is no question, the money is there. If they wanted to reduce their profit in order to make their building uh, cleaner and better and, and more accessible, they have plenty of money. They pay very little for the property uh, up front and they collect a lot in rent. And the reason for that is because there's no rent control on vacancies. So even though there is rent control, and, and this is the main difference between small landlords and large landlords. <coughs> small landlords are often reluctant to rent, you know, someone who's not even a landlord is reluctant to rent out a unit thinking that, you know, what if the, the operation of this rental ends up costing as much as the rent? I'm locked now, I can't raise the rent more than a certain percentage. This is not really an issue for large landlords because they see turnover and they see their units, uh, you know, the, the, the rental go up uh, exponentially. And, you know, in this one case, it's an extreme case, but many, I, I would bet that many buildings are in that, are in that category, especially when you look at the ownership and you trace it back to hedge funds and to, and to real estate investment trusts. They know what they're doing, they know that there's an amazing return, and that's why you see real estate investment trusts buying eight, 12 buildings in one day, and then next year buying 20 more buildings, and then two months later, 25 more buildings. It's because there's money in it. Yeah, um, just a, that's an amazing answer. Just to add to yeah. that, Acorn has been fighting for the past 14 years for what we like to call landlord licensing. Because like you said, there are good landlords and there are bad landlords. And the idea behind that would be it's kind of like a Chinese restaurant or whatnot. You walk in and you look in the window and there's a, a letter on a big placard that says A plus or like, yeah. right? I want to know the second I walk in before I even talk about renting this place. I want to see are there bed bugs? When did you last have any bed bugs? How many have the, did you act accordingly and treat the building? How was it treated? How long has it been since your last infestation? that, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you get bad landlords, and that information is made public knowledge, eventually the bad landlords wouldn't be able to operate anymore, right? So that would leave better developments and, and opportunities for the good landlords. Um, that being said, we got uh, the Rent Safe TO program, which is better than what it was, but it's still not um, what we'd like to see. We want to see bad landlords be hit with bigger fines, especially the people who have those deep pockets that can afford to pay these fines. I mean, like, 100, 200 is nothing for them. I mean, say, go for the big money. It needs to be punished. And so if they get more of a smack on the nose, they might feel like they need to change. But like the instance of my building, um, I believe they, they bought it, was built in the 70s. And I think most buildings, if they're not properly maintained, have like a shelf life of something between 40 to 50 years mm -hmm. before everything, it just needs to be gutted. And of course, to them, that's worth money. Dem demolish it build a brand new shiny condo and make more money. They don't care that they just replace the rest of us. Versus a small landlord who actually lives in the same building, you're sharing this roof, it's everybody's personal interest to make sure that repairs are made. And I say that I'm someone who either lives or intends to live or take that um, rental property back for their own usage, of course puts more effort into upkeeping it. And so there will be more output costs than input costs because clearly my landlord doesn't care about maintenance. They also would never came, come over and take a bath in my bathtub. Yeah. So, so I'm really sorry that it's been difficult for you, and especially so with like the Airbnb. That, but that mm -hmm. was a great question. I'm can, sorry that it can discouraged we, you. From this meeting, I expect to get some guidelines on costs and op, op, of operating a, a building yeah. to tell people so they know what they're paying for. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that to light. Uh, maybe you can come talk to us at the end. Yeah. Oh. And your name again? Johnny knows where I live. Oh, you okay. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You. Hi, I'll be quick. Uh, I live up in uh, 
Okay. Um, a couple of questions very quickly. Is there a move to tax tax on speculative property? Like uh, uh, condos or whatever, like buildings that uh, the investors just leave the thing vacant? Like I know there's stuff happening like that in, in Vancouver. And the other thing is, is um, who decides what gets built on city land? I mean, there's lots of city land out there. If they could be dedicated to affordable housing somehow, I mean, yeah. it seems to make sense for me. All those other sport land stuff. That, that's it. Thank you. My name is Neil Thank you. Thank you. Well, the city of Toronto did recently uh, reappropriate some land. Or was it? We got 21 sites. Yeah, the uh, plan is called Half Housing TO uh, on 11 sites that the city owns, and uh, the, the public consultations are out now, and uh, please connect with us so that you can make your comments on these, uh, on these lands. So these are 11 sites that were declared surplus, the city doesn't need them anymore, and they want to build housing there. So far, it's an okay plan, it could be a lot better. Half of the units are, on some sites, half of the units are going to be affordable. On other sites, it's not. Uh, there's a problem with the density. Yeah, so um, it, it comes down to what we discussed earlier about like inclusionary zoning. And um, from back in the Harris government, we basically got rid of all of our properties, our one land, and we sold it off. So this, these uh, little bits of land that we have left are basically like parking lots. They are near transport hubs. And of course, going to be great for condominiums. So, so um, we have developers who are hoxy toxy for these lands, and they're going to bid and they're going to argue amongst themselves. And then it's up to the city to choose whichever presentation, um, presentation proposition. I'm sorry, I'm bad with these words lately. That um, would work the best for us. And so we ask for, let's say, we ask for 30% of these apartments to be affordable market or. We got a certain amount of condos, we want to make sure there's a certain amount of rental, and then like maybe there's space left over for affordable. Um, the developer will take a look at what we want and say, well, this is what we can afford to do, otherwise it's not worth us to build on this land. Meanwhile, the city of Toronto does not have the money itself to put up these buildings. So we basically are in the developer's pockets. I mean, unless we ask for emergency funds from the kind of above us, but we don't want to do that. Because apparently they don't think it's a big enough problem. So, until housing is considered an emergency or a human right, we are going to have to ask the developers very nicely to please make some affordable housing for us. And the only way that's going to work is if we let them build more units. So, say for 26 floors, they're able to give us two. If we want four floors of affordable housing, we might have to let them build up to 30-something. So, these all come down to um, bids, and we do, at the City of Toronto right now, we're asking preference be given to the bids that include co-ops or um, non-profit developers because the, the developer is just going to build the building and then the maintenance, the looking after the building, the running of the rentals, that is going to go to hopefully a non-profit organization or like a private industry. So that is where the um, the rental costs come in, that's where the um, day-to-day like, -day -day functions and the management team comes to yeah. So um, it's difficult to say right now what we're going to get out of it. But these 11 um, sites are very important right now. And we're waiting to see what bids come in. And then we get to pick and choose the best and hope for the best. But what we're asking is that whatever is decided stays for 99 years at that rate of affordability and will not be broken. So you can um, come down to City Hall and hear more about that and tell John Tory your, your thoughts on it. But um, that's basically where we are right now. You have 11 sites left, and um, we're trying very hard to pick wisely. We'd like to see them be put up by nonprofits and co ops, right? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Nurana. I live in the area. Uh, my question is uh, I'm a first time small landlord, I have one unit. Uh, the question, uh, the challenge I had was uh, I rent out for, I'll tell the story in a question after. I rented, rented out to a gentleman. He had a uh, mental health issue. And for three months, the cops have to get involved. For three months, I couldn't collect the rent. And in the meantime, my bank sent me a letter saying I need to pay my mortgage, otherwise they will seize the property. So where would a, uh, I, I'm talking about a single landlord, like TGG landlord, where can they go for help? Uh, like can they come to your organization for help when they're in a situation like this? And also, if I'm going to rent it out like this, uh, to, uh, 
to you know put the way India in policy on provincial level or city level or federal level that supports uh, small landlords like me or myself who, who encourage them to uh, provide a provide a portable unit for the community. So that's my question. I'm not aware of any city policy that encourages small landlords one way or another. Uh, at the landlord and tenant board, if you go there, there is, uh, you can get not legal advice, what is it called? Legal information uh, from lawyers that are just hang out there all the time. Uh, you can ask them questions as a landlord or as a tenant. Um, oh, I'm not um, aware of any city. I could probably have more that. So the Landlord Self-Help Center, um, they're a legal clinic for small landlords. Um, so you could reach out to them and they could give you um, advice. Um, like I said, yeah, like legal advice. Um, like at Sierra, um, we're, we're looking more into uh, building partnerships with, with landlords and uh, giving education as well. Um, we just released um, an educational series for uh, for housing providers, um, small and large. Um, so even if you go to our website at equalityrights.org, there's a page on our website for information for landlords. So we have free uh, resources up there. So there's four um, four webinars and uh, and a guide as well. But uh, but there's no uh, support uh, like support system like uh, for like for for the time being that they're running through because. Uh, for the first two years, when I had the pro when I had the property, I was negative two hundred dollars. But with these things happened, so I was even negative more. So I, that, like I had to be from credit card and do it. But my question is, is there any policies that you guys talk about in the in, in the provincial level to support, like encourage? We're talking about affordability. So if we have lots of people do have basement units that they would like to rent, but there are certain sort of zoning that it's not allowed. Well, I would say. Um um, Doug Ford's whole idea about uh, making this quicker to evict people, I think from like whatever good spot he might have had in his heart, he was trying to help the small landlords by encouraging them. Because um, if you make it easier for you to evict people, maybe, like, because it's a horror story. I hear so many horror stories like this. And uh, as a tenant, and I fight for people's rights, and I am on OBSP, I believe that it's, um, it's a horrible stigma to have mental health, and everybody deserves to be housed. That being said, this is why I fight for co-ops. Because there are people who are mentally unstable to the point where it's not safe for them to live alone. Um, it could um, disrupt the enjoyment of anybody else living in their building. And um, we need we need specialized homes and buildings that can accommodate people with such needs so that the onus is not on you or small homeowners to have to take this into their house and then deal with these issues. Um, so if we try and focus on more building of co-ops and these group homes, then there will be more affordable housing. But um, I think when Doug Ford said it was easier to kick people out, right? That's the only thing that you can do now, I think, is um, go through the system, explain reasonable unemployment, and um, there's a small loophole about uh, you can stop renting if you are going to move your family in. That being said, can you come and talk to me when we're done this? Because uh, I have a friend who maybe works with Fred Victor, because I don't want to see anybody displaced. So the easiest way to get a tenant to leave rather than kicking them out is to find them somewhere else to live, right? And then, of course, um, it, it, without being discriminatory, you've got to be very careful. And maybe background check, if, you, if it's your own home and your family lives there, you really need to be careful who you rent out to. Which is why I don't like Airbnbs, okay? Well, that's another topic for another day. Thank you, Thank you very much. Elan, you said? Thank you. Uh, no one. No one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you have been very patient. Oh, very patient. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Arisha Morris, single mother of three. My question is about the waiting list for housing. Mm -hmm. How long do you have to wait? And why do you have to wait so long? 15 years. That's ridiculous. I still haven't gotten mine. My wait list is 14 years, and uh, I gave up. Okay. <laughs> that being said, now I kind of wish that I knew where I was in that list, but I'm probably going to be moving out of province before my affordable unit ever comes around. So, yeah. <laughs> the, reason, the reason people are waiting is that because the previous government, liberals and conservatives have ignored building affordable housing. And this is the reason that there is no stop for, for uh, uh, affordable housing. The people who are living in those conditions are needing actually uh, larger units because their family has increased and they are waiting too. 
So it's a really crisis. What we need is to build more housing so that we move the waiting list uh, quicker and faster. That will require a different kind of government, not for the sort of government, which is don't want to invest in affordable housing. And that's why we need an NDP government to deliver that. Basically, you're not going to get a unit until somebody dies. <laughs> That's right, their family member can take it over. Like, yeah, you'd be waiting for a long time until we make more. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a waiting for everybody to go ahead, but you let everyone have it. Oh, what a gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. Chivalry's not today. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick, and uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, Thank you, Mrs. Kurasan, for having this meeting. I just want to say that um, I live in a condominium, and what I have to do because of the lack of housing situation, I have to be helping family members and friends um, stay at my place, which sometimes can be very, very convenient. Saying that, um, Mr. Sam, I want to ask you a specific question. Um, do you have um, access to developers and builders um, prior to them building a building? Do you have that access? Uh, can you get access, like your uh, offices or the telephone or email addresses, et cetera, et cetera? Do you, can you access that as an MP? MP? Well, I mean, it, uh, right now, I cannot think of any, but uh, uh, I don't exactly know which developers you're talking about, but I think... Uh, okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. Well, um, I live um, on Mark Martha in the town of India, yeah. and there's a building beside me that has been approved uh, for a high rise, and I'm not sure if it's rental or it's economy, I think it's rental. Um, so I believe that, the reason why I ask you that question, I think that we can um, argue among ourselves, because I think sometimes the mistake that we make, uh, we're preaching to ourselves, as opposed to preaching to uh, the people that um, we need help from, or can help us, or discriminating against us. So. The reason why I ask this question, um, if we can build a partnership with some of these builders and landlords and you know new developments that are going, I think we will probably have more success. And the way I, I so I, I want to ask you, um, what are you name is Luke? Ebony. 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 And also, Eric. <laughs> um, I, I think for, if you can um, uh, develop partnership with these builders and these uh, developers and try to offer them some incentive and um, some, some kind of a whatever uh, to, to, help, to help you, help us, not you, help us in our quest because I think that's probably another way of approaching it. So I don't know what to think about that. If I understand clearly what you're saying, is okay. these developers are coming to our community. If they're building a park, if they're creating units for affordability, if those rents are affordable, those kinds of partnerships. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, yeah, well, well yeah. Um, if, if, um, like, instead of um, lobbying the government, and instead of fighting with some <coughs> men like, um, would never see a uh, duck for that meeting like this, or it's not gonna happen. Neither if we're gonna see them dirty, thank God you're here. But if we can develop, um, go straight to the poor, the poor, and, and meet with these developers and just sit down in their offices and say, we'll propose up for you. What can you say to you? What kind of, uh, what can we provide? Like, what can we give back to you for you to kind of uh, accommodate people that cannot afford um, market rental? Like Thank you. Sir. The answer to that is density. <laughs> but um, they basically just don't care. Uh, we were talking with um, Sean at the housing down at the city hall about uh, this discussion about these 11 sites that we are trying to appropriate. And I said, can we not do the same thing? Like, we want 50%. They said 30. I said, can we maybe make it 40% affordable if we give them like a bigger tax break? And the question there is, whose ball is in the court? We need it more than they do. If I said, oh, this is just what the cost of doing business in Toronto is, look how much money you guys are making off us, it's time for you to give something back, they like laugh in our faces. The what they want are more condos. 
So the only way that we are going to get more rental units is to allow them to build more condos, which means breaking the, the zoning bylaws, allowing them to build more floors per condo, allowing them to build more condos further and further away from the downtown core. And uh, in that, we hope to possibly get back a few more developments that are affordable. It is it's a horrible trap. I mean, until people stop showing interest in condominiums, they're going to keep throwing them up. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. If there's not any other questions, I guess, uh, concluding remarks? Uh, yeah, well, housing is a human right, um, and I think we need to make sure that that's enshrined in Canada. I think that we need, we desperately need affordable housing, and we need more rent, purpose-built rental housing being built as soon as possible in this city, because <coughs> people are suffering um, because of this. People are dying on the streets. So, how long we just finished the question. No, I don't have a question. Just okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, and thank you for for inviting us to speak. Um, yeah, I think the the main point is yeah that we do have a housing crisis, but I think all of us coming together, um, you know, there's a lot of power in, in people coming together, and I think that at the end of the day, like that's going to be our hope, and that's going to be our driving force, and. I just hope that, you know, this is sort of just the start of a conversation, but, you know, that there, there's just power in numbers, and I hope that we can come together on this. Thank you. Oh, well, I mean, yes, and I really appreciate everybody who came out here tonight, everybody who got off work a little bit early, everyone who knows that they're going to get home a little bit late or, you know, haven't had dinner yet. I really appreciate the sacrifice. Because um, yes, this is a, a issue larger than even just our personal problems. Um, everybody is upset by this, and everybody's affected differently. And there are people that are currently homeless. And I'm, I'll say that most people I have talked to that um, are living on the street currently have horribly sad but preventable stories about how they ended up homeless. And I'd say about two thirds of low to moderate income people, we don't have that kind of money in the bank. What my rent is one thousand four hundred. What do you have in the bank? I don't have next month's rent in the bank right now. You will lose your job. You're maybe one or two paychecks away from being homeless. And it can happen to anybody. You could have a slip and fall. You could have an accident. You could have a family member fall ill. Um, you could, unfortunately, didn't remember um, six fifty Parliament and they had that large fire. 1,500 people displaced like that. And a lot of them still haven't gotten a new home. Some of them are still in the hotels. And so we can't be blase about it. It can't be um, one of those things that, oh, it happened to everybody else and I said nothing until they came for me and there was nobody left to speak up. Simon Weiss and all said that. I'm so glad. But it didn't. That was about the Nazi Germany in the June. But we need to stand up and say something while it's happening to everyone else around us, because it will come for us. Eventually, it'll just be condos and there'll be nobody else left. And if you can't afford to live here in Toronto, well then, suck for you. I know so many people who work here but can't afford to live here. And so long as Toronto wants its economy to stay balanced, I mean, what happens if we all just say we can't work here? We can't afford to live here, we can't afford to work here. Does the economy just grind to a halt? So before it comes to that, we need to stand up and speak out. And it all starts like this. One voice might get lost in the wind, but when we're loud enough, we get heard. So thank you for coming out. I'd like to see some of you maybe become ACORN members. I'd like to see more of these spaces at City Hall when you're invited to town halls, when you're invited to um, discussion panels. Your opinion does matter, okay? Everybody's opinion matters. And if we all speak together as one voice, we will get this done. Thank you For our much. children and for the future.
just like, okay, it'll only bring in kind of premeditate false allegations when you present an issue to a community housing cooperation of such. You don't want to take the issue lightly because what, what you say has to be valid. All right? So, so when, when you have a complaint or a concern, you have to invest in your own correspondence integrity and, and you, you have to, to value that honor when presenting issues as to where tax dollars are going, where independent citizen estates and amenities, right? The, the basic needs are also things that give comfort to life and luxury to life, prestige to life, glamour to life. You understand? So consider these things distributed evenly, right, when it comes to independent citizen housing and amenities, right? So I don't want to trespass on your time, but I, I do hope that you appreciate the uh, appropriate advisory for some of these issues with the affordable housing and even subsidized housing, right? So I just wanted to keep this brief and, you know, in case I have any more questions, I'll attend another town, town meeting. Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge the presence of the Unison uh, Legal Clinic at the uh, Caleb Rogers. They also have a table in the front, so if you need any information about their housing uh, issues with representing, if you have any issues in housing, it's a community legal clinic, so they're very effective in terms of representing our community. So I also thank them for their invite. And if anybody has any um, need to fill out uh, any work orders or landlord tenant board things, you can approach Johnny and I, we can help you with those. And um, yeah, affordability is important. And as far as we're discussing luxuries, heat, water, all that, that is a human right we have those. If you want a fancy condo and you can afford it, that's fine. But my apartment better have lights, heat, running water. I don't think that's a luxury. So well, thank, thank you for coming well, out tonight. Thank you very much. And also if you have uh, to talk to me or uh, my staff, uh, I'm going to be a bit outside. So but thank you for your time and thank you for coming. And let's give it a talk.